Thank you. Is, is this working? This thing? Yeah, yeah. Kind of. um, thank you so much for having me here. It's a great day. We had the um, crits here at MTech, which is fantastic this afternoon. And um, so, um, off world architecture. So, um, I have kind of like a few different hats, which kind of Edith kind of referred to. I am indeed head of design technology at Hassel Studio. We're a large uh, international design practice, um, about 800 people large in uh, Australia, Asia, Europe, and uh, America. Um, I look at design technology there. Um, that's kind of the, the, the day job. Uh, but I'm also going to talk uh, a little bit about the side projects I do. And that's the main thing I'm going to talk about, which is, of course, the off-world architecture. Um, Besides that, I've also been teaching in, in a few places over the years. I've kind of got foots in, in practice and in um, and academia. I did some work down the road from me and the other architecture school. And, um, and as Elif mentioned, I've also been involved with, uh, for many years, uh, and now as a director of uh, Smart Geometry, which is this kind of group of people, computational design people from uh, lots of different practices, lots of different backgrounds that come together every, we used to come every year together, now it's every two years, and we run uh, 10 workshops um, parallel uh, over a period of, of six days. And is this kind of place that really is in between academia and, um, and practice. So um, what I'm going to talk about Today really started quite a few years ago, I would say, exactly at Smart Geometry. I think it was like 2004, and we had a Smart Geometry in Waterloo University in Canada. And I really want to show this slide, because there's a few um, alumni from MTech on that slide as well, as you might recognize. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you, you, you probably know who they are. And it was a great year, you know, we had Mark Bowie there, Philip Beasley, Neri, Achim, Andrew. Um, and this was like early days of, of, of parametric modeling, right? This is the days when we were using generative components. Probably nobody uses that anymore here, you know, shows my age. Um, but it was like really the early days, like struggling with it. But it was really exciting because the software actually got changed and rewritten overnight uh, when we were doing that. Um, I could probably give a whole lecture about that kind of stuff, but I'm not going to do it today. Um, I'm going to talk about the fact that I found in the basement of Waterloo University this machine, 2004. That was the first 3D printer I saw with my own eyes, right? I saw it working. We actually were super excited about it that we could use that technology. Um, this was like a, a Z Corp machine. And I really pushed hard to get the participants of the Smart Geometry Workshop to get their models 3D printed. And it was kind of like magic, I thought, back then. Um, but of course, as an architect, you, you stand in front of these machines and you see them building stuff layer by layer magically, and you think, well, you know, I want to do this for real. I want to do this at a real scale. Why can't I do architecture like that one to one? And uh, it was a bit of a dream, but that dream kind of became reality uh, the moment I met this guy, which is on the, on the left there. That's Rupert Saw. Um, he was at that point, uh, uh, I think it was a senior lecturer or a professor, I'm not sure, at uh, Loughborough University. His background was engineering. He was really interested in uh, building physics. And he's standing there in actually a scaled up version of a, a part of a termite mount. Because right? he was really interested in starting to understand how termite mounts really operated, how the air circulated around them, how they controlled the internal environment. And he had some money from, um, I think it was an EPSRC grant, and the idea about the grant was to really start to understand how a termite mount operated, right? Um, at that point, nobody really um, knew what they probably, the most researchers did was actually kick a hole in it and kind of see what it kind of the internal structure was, but nobody really scanned one or had a digital model of it. 
So the grot, what they did was they actually poured it full of plaster to, um, so it's a bit of a low risk picture there, full of plaster and to start to understand what that, uh, the internal structure is. Uh, that was in Namibia, I think. Now, um, once you get this kind of plaster thing, you still can't do much with it, right? You can't, it's kind of difficult to scan. So the next thing they did is they built this massive rig, which you see on the left-hand side there. Um, you can see these were structural engineers designing this. Uh, very sturdy thing. And what they did, they poured plaster into this termite mount, and then they had a big grinder, which is the big red thing, that grinded it off layer by layer. And then every centimeter, they took a picture on the right hand side. And that way they were able to build up layer by layer this digital model. It's a great uh, research project, interesting outcomes. And they brought the whole rig with them back to Loughborough University. And then when they had the genius idea to reverse the process, right? What don't we, instead of kind of slicing it off, and demolishing that thing layer by layer, why don't we do the opposite and start to think about building something layer by layer. So the big kind of rig on the left-hand side was really the first um, big, large-scale 3D printer in the world. Um, and it ended up being a, a research project between uh, Foster and Partners, where I was at the time, together with Bureau Happold and uh, Love University. And I remember really this kind of conversation we had with them um, because we were wondering, yeah, what material are we going to use? And we kind of came up with this kind of very quick decision. We we're like, well, well let's just use concrete because we kind of we kind of built with that stuff already, don't we? We kind of know it, so let's, just, let's do concrete. Yeah. So that was a very quick decision. I thought we maybe should have thought about it a bit longer. Um, and so we started to kind of develop a concrete printing system. Uh, on the right hand side, that was like the, the next generation. We thought, well, it's, well, robots have been developed for a long time. Let, why not use a uh, robotic arm to do it? And I think that was really the first ever, 2009, the first ever uh, 3D printed concrete, let's say, piece of architecture. It was kind of a wall type thing. Um, and that was that. Um, now, since then, as you all know, lots of companies kind of start, the universities start to kind of do this stuff. Um, putting a, a concrete printer on a rig or on, on a robot, robotic arm. You know, there was a big company in China, Winston doing it. There's X3 in, in, in uh, France doing it. So lots and lots of companies doing that. And, um, but I always kind of question the output of what is happening with that. This is kind of Winston's first idea of what you can a concrete printer house is. I think uh, AP Score does it slightly better. Um, but I still think there's like massive um, limitations to it. Because in the end, what most of these companies do is they print concrete. Concrete is a concrete wall is never just a concrete wall. It's always a combination of rebars, right? Um, if you want to take up any uh, anything else, then um, if you want to take up tension in your structures, you're going to need concrete. You're going to need steel, right? You can't just do it with concrete on its own. So, for me, just using concrete to print with, um, you can't do that much with it. You can build some walls, but um, I think the efficiency of, of, of two blokes with uh, some breeze blocks is really hard to beat, I think, right? Um, so is it really the right, what do we, what, the question is, what do we really do with this technology? I always ask myself, because really what you can do with it is create compression-only structures, right? It works really well, the concrete works really well in, in, in compression. So if we start thinking, Compression only structures. Well, you know, I immediately think of the, the really nice work what Philip Block does um, in his Block Research Group. This is at the Venice Biennale, of course, where you have compression only structures, really beautiful shell structures. And that's really the kind of application that I've been using now um, 3D printing for in quite a different location. And 
which is Mars. And this is the project I'll be talking about uh, most for, for the rest of the evening, um, is about this project and how we've created this 3D printed shell structure. But I don't only want to talk about the 3D printing part of it, it's just only like a small part of it. I actually want to talk about how you redesign something for a completely different environment. All right. um, this project was part of a competition, a competition organized by NASA. Um, so NASA has this um, uh, funding model that's called the Centennial Challenges. Um, they were set up, I think, about eight years ago. And the idea about the Centennial Challenges is that they try to bring in different types of industry, different types of uh, universities into the space development world. Right? So they don't just want to work with the Boeings and the Lockheed Martins. They want to see, is there other industries that can really help us? So the Centennial Challenge, this Centennial Challenge, the idea was, can we um, 3D print Mars habitats? That was the, the, the kind of the, 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 the top line of this competition. So how do you start, architect? How do you start? designing something for a different planet. And you might think this, is, this must be like a really technical thing, right? Because what, what, what examples do we have? Well, this is it, right? The uh, International Space Station, the ISS. Um, highly, highly engineered uh, project, the, the, one of the most expensive objects ever made by humans. Um, and I asked myself the question, how, what skill do I have as an architect to come into this field, right? Um, but then I think I'm kind of convinced myself really quickly that I do have a role to play. When well, you just look at the inside of the ISS, right? So this is how engineers design your uh, workplace. Um, you know, I, I don't think, I don't know who wants to live here for six months or, or a year. So um, I do think like design has a role to play, right? And I started looking in, um, the history a little bit as well of um, uh, space development um, and so and where were the designers involved um, the first architect or the first designer involved in space uh, was uh, Raymond Lowy right and he was the and that was for project uh, Skylab so Skylab was the first um, let's say a habitat or the first space station, orbital space station, where astronauts were really inhabiting space. They were there for weeks and months. They were not just there for days, right? So um, they, they had to inhabit space. So the first time they, they brought designer in, and that was uh, the famous industrial American designer, uh, Raymond Lowy. So he was uh, brought onto, onto the project. Um, now, in the beginning, they were very, very skeptical about him coming in into this team with very kind of full of space engineers, basically, because they were wondering, like, what is this dude going to do? Like, you know, what is he going to do? Like, choose the color or something, you know? Um, which he did do. He did choose the color. Uh, but he did a couple of other things, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and the other things he did, you most of them you see on this on this picture. So. The first thing uh, he did was he put in a, a personal space for each of the astronauts. You know, um, Skylab was a really big, big volume, really, and the engineers did not think the space engineers did not think that the the, the astronauts needed their own private space. And I think if you were there for months, you do want that. You don't want to be with the same three people same space the whole time. So he brought in a kind of a personal sleeping pod for each of the, of the astronauts. Um, second thing, and you can actually see it on the, on the picture, is he designed the table. You might think, well, okay, it's kind of a cool table. Um, it's not shocking, world, world changing, is it? Well, if you look at the original design of the um, of Skylab, the engineers created these little little tablets that came from the side of Skylab. So there was one kind of here, there was one over there, and one over there, or something like that. So the astronauts were going to have a meal and not be able to have a conversation 
right? Because uh, for the engineers, it was the most optimum thing, just have a little flappy thing from, from the wall. So that was the, the second thing he, he, he brought in. Um, the third thing I think is the most shocking thing after all is the thing you see in the back, and that's a window, right? In the original design of Skylab, uh, there was not going to be a window. Because the engineers thought, uh, well, that's really um, a, a risk, right? It's a risk we don't want to take. It's a, it's a weakness in the structure. So why don't we have our astronauts in this capsule going around Earth for months at a time and not ever being able to see this? And you might think, well, this is, this is, this is crazy, right? Um, so... You, of course, think NASA's never going to make that, that mistake again because, um, well, they kind of did. Because um, So this is the, the, the cupola in the International Space Station. Um, the cupola was designed, it took 23 years from design to implementation, right? Um, and it got each time taken out because it wasn't deemed necessary, right? Um, but... Because that thing came in, the ISS actually, people actually start to know the ISS more. Because people kind of forgot that we had the International Space Station. But suddenly, every astronaut was having, taking pictures, taking it in front of this cupola. Hatfield was playing his guitar in front of it. And suddenly, you know, people got more and more engaged with it. Um, and that's indeed that, that cupola. I, remind, I need to grab a book now. Hang on one second. It's in my bag here. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I was going to read something, but I'm probably not going to find it now. Anyway, um, the second person I really admire is uh, Galina Balashova. Uh, I've got the book here. I was going to read a, a quote of her, but I'm not going to find it. Um, anyway, she works for um, the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, and she was the really the only architect, qualified architect, to ever work for the, the their space agency. And I do love the kind of drawings that she's done and, and the work she's done. Uh, some of the work she's done is actually in uh, an exhibition at the moment in the Design Museum. Uh, you should go and check that out. Um, so she works on the interior, for example, of this one. And this is um, this was exhibited in the Science Museum a few years ago. So this was the Russian moon lander that actually never flew. So the Russians also had their own version of a moon lander. This was one designed for one uh, cosmonaut, not an astronaut, cosmonaut. And um, Galina actually worked on the interior of that. She also worked on the interior of Soyuz and uh, the interior of Mir. And what I do love about it is just this kind of completely different look at how a space for a cosmonaut would look like. Yeah, why not have some wood veneer? Why not look at the colors? And why not look at how things are placed? Um, and these are kind of, for example, her, her drawings from uh, the Mir uh, space station, which I think is has a certain sensitivity if you kind of look at the pure engineering drawings. Um, and she had, she had a hard time actually placing herself with those engineers. Um, because she had to decide where everything go, where ergonomically things went. And then she had this constant struggle with the engineers who only were thinking about their particular bit that they did. And uh, she was the only one who actually had an overall view over the whole project. And that's what architects do, right? We're kind of not specialists in anything, but we kind of have an idea of, we were able to kind of think in a more, uh, a whole way around the project. So, um, but back to Mars now. So these are kind of my heroes, right? Designers in space. Let's go back to Mars. Um, what's the issue with Mars? It's a big issue with it, right? Um, because it's, it's kind of different than Earth. First thing is the distance, right? So that picture, that drawing, shows you the relative distance, the actual distance between Earth and the Moon. 
and I think that takes about three days to get there, right? People always think that, that the moon is actually closer. It's actually quite far. That is roughly about 300,000 uh, kilometers. The International Space Station is only 300 or 400 kilometers away from the Earth's surface. So that's a thousand times that distance. And that's what, you know, there's an uh, Earth rise. Um, picture taken from Earth from uh, moon orbit. And if I take the same picture from Mars, I get that, which is just a little dot. This is Earth taken from the Curiosity rover standing on Mars, a tiny, tiny speckle in the sky. Now, um, the distance is a thousand times the distance moon um, Earth, right? So, how do we get there? Well, um, the interesting thing about designing something on uh, another planet, the, the crucial thing is how you get stuff there, right? Um, it's actually not very different to when you, when you think about designing something on Earth. You also need to think about how you're going to assemble it, how it gets there. Here, it's, it's slightly more, more crucial. So, um, this is, we, we work together with the, with the uh, Kreinfeld University, the space engineering course. And um, so, this was kind of a sketch idea on how we're going to get there. So, this is our Mars transfer vehicle and uh, what you see here i'm going to point at it you know yeah so these are what is in here is a lander with the cargo whatever that is can be uh probably part of the habitats or something like that but for these two bits to get to mars you need all this fuel right because it's about a year to get there and that's the engine now to get all that into space you need to have each of these on a different launch vehicle. So we actually worked it out quite, you know, there's a lot of calculations, spreadsheets behind it, but you really need to think about how many launches you need to do from Earth into Earth orbit, and then you assemble your vehicle, which is this one, and your cargo to go to Mars. So I think in total for our project, we were looking at about 34 SLS launches, which is a space launch um, system, which is a, a NASA rocket, which is in development. So um, yeah, you need to start thinking about that, right? So you see the sheer uh, difficulty to get something to Mars makes you think, well, we really have to think about it. What we take with it, that we take the minimum amount of material possible. Um, and which gives you a different way of thinking, I think, and I'll show it in, in a few other slides, is that although you might not think this is a, a sustainable project, the way you think about it is you have to think in a hyper-sustainable way. You really have to think about recycling, remaking, reusing in an extreme way. So. Um, there's kind of like a duality in that project, right? And of course, like going to Mars is not sustainable. But uh, the way you think about it, it has to be. And then the environmental factors, right? It's, it's quite harsh. So this is, if you have a storm on Mars, it's, uh, it goes over the whole planet and it can last months. These are two pictures of Mars on two different dates. And you see, this is a storm happening on Mars. Very, very fine dust. Um, now, the really kind of um, driver for our design project was um, radiation. So, in space, you have solar radiation, you have cosmic radiation, and you, and which is gamma radiation, which is very radioactive. Um, the great thing about being on Earth, of course, is that we have a magnetic fields around our planet, which makes that these kind of gamma radiation gets deflected. Most of it gets deflected from our planet, which is a very good thing. Problem is when we go to Mars, we don't have that. So you have that radiation happening all the time on, on the planet, and it's really dangerous, for example, when there are solar flares. When you get solar flares, the exposure of that, I think there's about a 50% chance that you will die within the first week. Right, so it's it's yeah, it's life and death. These these kind of protections. So we really need to think about how we're going to protect ourselves on 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 Mars. And this is another picture taken from the Curiosity rover, um, and that you know just that picture also kind of. Um, here to kind of explain it's very cold. People think like Mars seems to be quite warm. No, it's very cold. It's on average, I think the, the warmest it ever gets is about 20 uh, degrees Celsius. 
the holders, I think it's like minus 150. Um, roughly, let's say average temperature was minus 60. Minus, about minus 60 there. Um, atmosphere, it's also very different. The atmosphere is 100 times less dense and it's mainly CO2. Right? Uh, at least you have an atmosphere there. Right? So which is, it's, it's better than, than the moon where you don't have anything. So that kind of to set out the environmental parameters of this project. Um, so this was kind of our, one of our uh, sketches, or one of our drawings uh, for the project that nicely explains, I think, the, the, the different parts of it, right? You have um, this kind of shell structure, which is a 3D printed shell structure done uh, with regolith, I'll explain in a minute. That's our protection shield, right, against the, the radiation. And underneath we have um, a bunch of pods, habitat pods, uh, which are inflatables, and inside we have then the interior. So that's kind of the, the, the main structure of our um, habitat. Now, often people kind of look at science fiction for uh, to get inspiration or to get to look at a kind of an analog. Um, we didn't do that for this one, but I did, I did think about one thing which I find was kind of an interesting analog was these, right? Um, these are also pioneers, right? Um, slightly different pioneers, they're going west in the US. Um, also had to travel light, didn't have to take that much with them. And when they finally arrived, they had to kind of do with what they have, right? So they didn't have that many tools with them. And um, I love this idea of a log cabin because a log cabin is a is a habitat that you can make with a very simple tools, right? There's no complicated metal work. It's basically just tree trunks uh, stacked on top of each other with interesting, uh, quite simple interlocking mechanisms. So they just used whatever was there in the land when they arrived, uh, and didn't have didn't it was actually a very simple construction technique. Um, so what do we have? We go to Mars. Well, we don't have much. This is another. This is kind of like um, curiosity taking a picture from his, his own tracks in the surface. We have this. We have regolith. We have rocks, and we have Martian dust. So, um, what are we going to do with that? Well, let's see this plays. Yeah, it plays. So we're thinking of creating our uh, shell structure, our protection system, by 3D printing layer by layer, um, this shell structure, right? By using Martian regolith, Martian dust. Um, as you notice, we don't have a big printer to do this. We really have just, uh, we have kind of small printers or kind of a swarm of little machines doing this. And let me just go into that in a bit of detail. So we have three, is it better? Don't know. Can everybody hear me in the back as well, yeah? Yeah, cool. Um, so we have four um, different <laughs> robots. First one goes and looks for the right regolith. The second one is the digger, and that goes and digs up the regolith. The third one is the depositor, brings the regolith to your site, to your construction site. And the fourth one is the sinter or the microwave uh, robots. That it's bad like that, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah. Um, that microwaves all the layers together. And that was our swarm of robots. Um, some of them we made up. Um, the one on the right, actually, the, uh, is one developed by, by, by NASA, um, with the, the, the Razor robot. It's kind of an interesting system because it actually has these two drums that kind of digs itself into the earth and starts rotating and picking up the regolith. The reason for that is that a normal kind of um, uh, digger machine that you would have on earth, when it just kind of digs up, um, works slightly differently because they're heavy machines and they use their own weights to really kind of actual reaction, pick up dust or earth. Um, we 
only have a third of gravity on, on, on Mars, so we don't have that weight to actually dig. So that's why we have that system, which has two drums that kind of counter-rotate, and the whole thing actually kind of digs itself into the Earth. Once it has everything, it kind of transports it. That was our, our robots that we kind of made up. But I, this was like one of the first renderings we got from our uh, visualization team. And I noticed on the, they kind of put this thing in on the right hand side, which are all the robots that are kind of done. They finished their job. And there is kind of a, a graveyard of robots happening there. Um, and I thought, well, this, this is kind of wrong, right? You know, we've kind of flew that way. We had these robots creating the shell structure, and then we're not going to do anything with them. You know, remember that we want to recycle, reuse whatever we bring there as, as, and, and, uh, as much as we can. So I thought, well, this, this is wrong. Right, so we went back to a drawing board and we actually kind of started to rethink our robots. And uh, they might be less optimum than, than, than the first generation, but this second generation is a set of robotic systems that is modular. And uh, they use the same uh, wheels, the same, the same uh, topology, and they do the same job. So this is the one. Uh, the one wheel one that actually kind of goes out and uh, looks for the right regolith. If you have six wheels, two diggers, you can make a, a digger robot again. Or we can make it into uh, a transporter, or a transporter then becomes uh, a center or stroke uh, microwaving robot. You can see him here in the field working. I had a lot of comments from uh, mechanical engineers on, 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 on this one wheel one, which was quite funny, because they were all like, yeah, that'll never work, right? Um, uh, this, is, this is a stupid idea. And they were like, yeah, yeah, it might be. But um, funnily enough, when they kind of looked at the video quite uh, a bit more in detail, the one comment they always had was like, yeah, but that, yeah, that modular thing, yeah, that, that might work though. So uh, that may be a bit of confidence to kind of, that we might be in the right direction of something. It might not be just a one wheel one, but um, I do believe somehow um, we're onto something here. Uh, so that is then the, the, the microwaving one. Um, no, we didn't just invent this microwaving thing. Yeah? Um, there are actually uh, the German Space Agency and there's another research group in Hawaii, Pisces, who are actually doing research into microwaving uh, basalt or kind of regular type materials. So, um, and that's kind of the, the thing what we did with this whole project. We never kind of, it's not a science fiction project, right? We looked at technology that is out there, that is being researched, and that we hope that will be on point within the next 10 years. Right. So for that, we kind of gathered existing tech that we knew somehow this is feasible. And it's like a drawing to kind of show how uh, the system is able to kind of go up and lower to how it's kind of reconfigurate itself into uh, whatever it, it needs to be. And I just want to kind of put this one up because I think it shows you that I think our robotic system is some quite unique, I think, because it sits in between these two extremes, right? They have on the left-hand side these, this is the Tesla factory, uh, very effective, these robots, very productive, they do uh, a very specific task and do very well over and over again. The problem is if one robot fails in that uh, production line, uh, we have a big problem. There's no redundancy in that system, so they'll have to bring another robot in immediately. Um, on the right hand side is, uh, I think this is pushed by Harvard, is uh, some swarm robotics where, um, you know, you can get rid of half of them, the system will still work, but you do have to ask yourself what kind of it actually produces, how effective is it in its actually doing something. And that's somehow I think we're somewhere in the middle um, where we do have a system that is modular, can behave as a swarm, but it has still is quite pragmatic at the same time. So um, we're kind of thinking now, kind of actually developing that that idea further in in a few research projects. Now, um, our system has, as you kind of noticed earlier, here's actually two systems, right? It's um, 
that shell structure and uh, an inflatable. Now, we, um, we actually went a little bit against the rules that NASA set. Because NASA's in the brief, they kind of said that we had to create something that would be able to contain an environment. So we had to create a 3D printed structure that was able to contain uh, a pressurized volume. Now, we never really believed in that. Right? Uh, I'm not sure who has 3D printed structures, um, but to 3D print something and believing that that will be a complete sealed unit, um, you know, I think that's way too risky. I think you have to de-risk it and have two systems where you have a shell structure which will protect yourself from radiation and you have an internal inflatable which is manufactured on Earth with um, tolerances that we can manufacture here, and we're sure that you know our astronauts are not going to die, and they are protected in this in this environment. Um, so we kind of had a different view on that. Um, we also worked with actually O'Callaghan engineers um, to create these shell structures. As I said before, if you three print something, concrete or here just microwave regular together, which would perform even worse than, 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 uh, than concrete, um, you really only want to do compression only structures. Right? So we didn't really design it, we gave it the parameters of it, and then um, with tools like uh, Kangaroo, we're able to create that optimum shape. And that was done by, uh, by EOC engineers. Um, the great thing about it is that, you know when you do um, shell structures, compression-only structures, the problem is always when you get um, bending in them or when you get uh, wind loads, lateral loads on it, right? Uh, big issue. The great thing in, on Moon is that um, the atmosphere is 100 times less dense than on Earth. Right? You have a CO2 atmosphere, it's 100 times less dense, which means the wind on, if you have a 200 kilometers of wind on Mars, which does exist, the pressure you get on your structure is almost nothing. Because the parts, you have 100 times less particles blowing on your structure. So it's actually quite interesting. So it's actually an ideal uh, environment to start thinking about compression on your structures. Um, and just this as, as, as a kind of uh, a, a reference, of course, Felix Candela's uh, structures, which I think that the same idea, they had this kind of in-situ, on-site manufactured shell structure, not with robots, but with lots of people, right? And afterwards, you get to, uh, the facades are, of course, not made on site. They'll be made in factories coming in afterwards. So that idea of having two systems, uh, prefabricated one, and an in-situ one coming together, um, that's actually the one that we followed as well. Now looking into the inflatables, right? So uh, we have, each time in the project, we have these kind of larger pods and we have the smaller connection pods, right? And those are kind of a system where we unfold and at the same time inflate. Again, it's not something we just made up, right? Uh, NASA has been looking at this research project with Goodyear in the uh, 1960s, already looking at inflatable systems for space. And inflatable systems are great because you can, they're quite light, you can pack them up quite small, which means your launch costs actually go, go lower. Um, there was actually a really serious research project at uh, NASA, um, which is called TransHab. And I really like this idea because this one has, um, you see in the middle, you have a very kind of a hard shell element that's not inflatable, and the outside is inflated, which means if it's compacted, you can get it in the fairing of a rocket, SLS, whatever, and then once in space, you actually kind of inflate it. And that didn't stay as just a research project. Um, at the moment, uh, at the International Space Station, there is this inflatable module. It's actually done by a private company called Bigelow. Uh, they bought the license of inflatable architecture or inflatable systems from NASA and are developing that now. Um, and their goal is actually have inflatable uh, space hotels. So uh, they're quite serious about it. It's been tested at the International Space Station. It's still a quite small module. There's a person in that um, module. It's just a pure 
research a testing facility now to see if we can actually do this. So, um, so that's our habitat, right? And um, remember what I said in the beginning with Raymond Lowy and, and the ISS to have like a beautiful window, right? You know, well, we didn't, we didn't really have that. Um, and the ISS has a very, I would say an engineering approach to it, right? Because they have these flaps that are able to kind of close and protect uh, the cupola, because that's what it's called, this big window is called the cupola. Um, I thought it would be interesting to kind of not go for an engineering approach and go for an architectural approach. Something like this, right? Courtyards, Mediterranean courtyards. What they're great for is they bring in sunlight, they bring in indirect light and um, without direct sunlight, and they also uh, give great views across your space, across, across the habitat. And, um, so we did something similar. So we created this courtyard in our um, uh, space that uh, with views across, right? And we did quite a bit of analysis to look at uh, if it actually works. We had to kind of tweak the parameters a little bit. Um, but in the end of the day, it was the same tool we would use to do some solar analysis on a building on Earth. Um, the only difference is that, like you see, the kind of the habitat is like the, where the, the the white circles are. It's all in the blue, so we never have direct sunlight there. Um, which is, it's not that your building is going to overheat; it's that you could potentially die. So it's it's quite it's quite a crucial thing to do. Um, then, building these shell structures. Um, they're quite hard, shell structures are quite hard to do. This is uh, Philip Bloch's uh, uh, armadillo thing in the Biennale. As you see, they only work once they're f finished, right? So you need to do a full um, uh, structure underneath, a support structure, a formwork, before you can kind of build it. And you might have seen our video, right? It kind of quickly, quickly, quickly built it up, and there was no support. Um, we were very much aware of that, and we did try to solve that. Um, <laughs> our first idea was the following, right? Our first idea was, oh, why don't we use another inflatable? Right? Why don't we have a big inflatable that sits underneath and is your uh, scaffolding, really, for building? But then again, it's still a really big thing. This is a massive inflatable, and we... We're never quite confident about it. And we start to think about, can we do this in a slightly different way, in a bit more of a clever, or maybe even a dumber way, right? And um, so we, we looked at examples like this, uh, Sano's uh, Tashima Museum, which is this beautiful shell structure. And uh, the way that was built was by earth formwork. So they made an earth uh, mount and then put the concrete on, on top of that. Um, but we were like, yeah, is this really going to, to work, right? How, how much time digging, how much time uh, taking the, the regolith out again, is that going to work? So we worked again with our, with our team from uh, Cranfield University. They had their spreadsheets ready, and they were able to tell us that it will take, I think it was about, it will take us about a year longer to construct. Um, and the process we had was indeed, instead of um, just building it up without uh, formwork, we would use regolith, loose regolith, to build it up layer by layer, and in the end, we would just take it out. Yeah. Right? We can use the same type of robots, they could reconfigure themselves in the end, they could become all diggers, and uh, take all the regolith out. So we kind of figured out that, that shell structure. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the interior as well. So this is uh, the Columbus module in the uh, International Space Station, this is the European Space Agency's um, uh, research module. Um, it's kind of an interesting uh, thing, because it's a very simple idea, right? It's a simple idea is that you have a cylinder, and on the left and the right hand side, you have size racks, and the top and the bottom, you may basically have storage. And have these size racks, so it's kind of a corridor with each time a size rack, and they do operate these things and uh, set up their experiments, they move up to another one. 
And this is actually how the whole International Space Station works. It's all like this. It's corridors with science racks on the side, left and right. Um, and I actually think it's like a really inefficient structure. Because the eye says if you talk to astronauts, they say, yeah, it's way too big. It's like massive for them, right? And actually, it's from an architectural design perspective, it's a bit of a crappy structure, I would think, right? Uh, like, which, which building do you know where you just have corridors and stuff on the sides? Like, it's, it's a bit of a bizarre thing to think about. So we started to kind of thinking, can we do this a bit better, right? So um, again, we came up with like a kind of a stupid idea, but um, these, these uh, archives uh, racks that are just able to move around. Um, and you just go in whenever you need to do something. If you don't need, need to be there, just close it up. Um, that's the same idea we had there. So we kind of, we didn't do it in a linear way, we did it in a, in a circular way uh, for our pods. And each time, each of these pods has these rack systems that are able to move. And some of them are science racks, some of them are part of the greenhouse, but they all have the same idea. You were able to kind of compact so much more stuff in a much smaller space. And you just open a rack, use it, and then close it afterwards. And this, this is one of the physical models we did, so you kind of see, uh, so each of the, of the pods is, is a different function. One of them is, is a living space and kitchen, the other one is a lab. We have um, a fabrication lab as well, a greenhouse and so forth. And uh, the connection pods, each for the connection pods is your life support system. So, and they serve one on the left and one on the right. So there's like a triple redundancy in the system as well. And then the third opening, it can be a suit port, which is on the outside there, or um, a normal hatch that goes to uh, one of the rovers. So this was kind of one of our, um, our interior views, which I showed you before. Um, there's a few clues in there that we, we try to do things slightly slightly different, I think, than, than normally when you, when you look at an ISS or something like that. Um, and we, we got a lot by talking to different types of people right, in this project. And one of the people we talked to was um, John Eager, and he is, uh, was the winterization, I think he's a captain or something like that, winterization captain of Halley 6, which is the British Antarctic Survey. They live there for eight months. They're completely disconnected from the rest of the world. There's no way to evacuate from it, right? There's a doctor there, and if something needs to happen, <laughs> it will be with that doctor, that's it, right? Um, you can escape from, you be evacuated from the ISS in about, I think about 12 hours. Um, no way out in winter. So it's a good uh, analog for uh, Mars. And we talked a lot about them, how it is to live there, and they sent us some pictures, so that's kind of how it looks like. Um, and one of the complaints they had, John had like, well, the start, the complaint was they had that, the fact is they kind of live in their workplace, right? They kind of, and this thing kind of looks a bit like a workplace. Actually, it looks a bit like a, like some cheap hotel, I think. But, um, and they also complained about there's no tactile, Material, it's all rubber and painted and whatever. There's nothing tactile. They didn't, they wanted to have something that felt like a home because they lived there for eight months. And then he sent me this thing. Actually, he talked to me about it and then I asked him to take the picture, which was this. Um, and this is part of their living space and they wanted to clad one of the walls in wood. And the wood they have was from packaging crates. So they made their only little thing, their own little wall, panel wall. It looks like in their local pub or something like that, because the reason was they wanted something tactile, something that wasn't looking like a lab or a workplace or this kind of terrible flooring they have there. So they wanted something that felt like a home, and it just made me think, you know, what uh, Galena was doing in, in, in that kind of lunar lander, make it look like a place to live. So we did the same. So as you see, the flooring here is, um, is actually lam is, is bamboo. You see some bamboos growing in the background. So we start to think about, we, maybe we shouldn't grow stuff to eat, but, sorry, but maybe we should grow stuff on Mars to build. Because if you grow stuff to eat, you need loads and loads of volume. You know, you're never going to get there. Remember like Biosphere 2, back in the 90s somewhere? There was a massive project that, uh, in Arizona, I think, trying to sustain, I think, 10 people. And it was a massive building. It, did, it actually completely failed. Um, 
So we were thinking maybe we just grow stuff to build stuff with or make flooring or something like that. Um, another thing you might kind of think, which is a bit weird, is, is the, the big spacey furniture. You might think, well, didn't you just talk about the whole time that you want to have compact stuff? Are you going to have this massive chaise longue there? Um, well, we did think about that. Um, the idea is that you will not bring it and that you'll 3D print this um, with your own printer on Mars. There's no point in bringing these big things. Um, so why not 3D print it with recycled materials? Uh, and we collaborate with this with uh, Manuel from Nagami. And, um, and we looked at his 3D printing process. And he actually designed for us some furniture for our Mars base, and this is done by recycled, with recycled plastics. And you can imagine that your astronauts would have lots of um, uh, packaging material from experiments or from food and all that. So um, what are you going to do with it? There's no waste recycling unit on Mars. So why not reuse it and start 3D printing with it? Of course, we're not going to bring in massive like ABB or KUKA robots. And so in the, in the, in the left, uh, you see like a, a Delta 3D printer printing one of their first chairs. And this is, this is the, um, uh, the, the workshop really for the habitat, which was actually also an idea we had by talking to people from the uh, Halley 6. Because when they looked at our plans, the first thing they were like, so where am I going to fix stuff? Right? Where's your workshop? Because apparently that's about half the time they spent is actually fixing stuff, making the thing run. Same thing on the ISS. So because of that, we actually start to change our design slightly. Now, we also start thinking what these astronauts are going to wear. Right? Um, on, am I standing on something? Or <laughs> um, can we turn that light off? Or? Is that right? I thought we were just tripping something. Um, so the, at the moment, so the astronauts in the ISS, they wear like uh, some cargo pants and a polo shirt that they only wear for a few days and then they get rid of it and it gets burned up in the atmosphere in one of their, 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 their cargo units. So not exactly sustainable. You can't do that on Mars, you can't just throw it out. So uh, we start working with uh, Christopher Rayburn, um, who has a design practice here in, in Hackney, and he looks at uh, reusing materials. Like for example, he uses um, parachute material, the one on the left there's a parachute, there. I'm wearing one as well there, and reuses it and remakes uh, jackets and, 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 and clothes out of that. So we start thinking, well, maybe, maybe that's what happened on Mars as well, because we have landing parachutes. A lot of this stuff will be landed on Mars with massive parachutes. Why not reuse that again? Right? So it's again that idea of kind of thinking really radical about recycling and reusing. And you see the, the, the one of our two astronauts um, wearing them. So that was kind of the end of our, of our, of our project, but um, luckily it didn't really stop there, because then we got approached by uh, the Design Museum here in London, and just by pure luck, they were thinking of organizing um, an exhibition uh, titled Moving to Mars. <laughs> It's, and they were very particular about it. They were like, yeah, this is not um, an exhibition about Mars in the Science Museum. This is in the Design Museum. Um, it's still on. It's on until the 23rd of uh, February. And they asked us to see if we could actually make one of our pods on Earth. So that's what we did. These kind of pictures were taken a, a couple of weeks ago. So, and we wanted to make sure that, that you can go and visit that in the design museum now. You can go inside, you can touch stuff. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it, it really felt uh, quite immersive, right? So we have indeed an inflatable structure, which you can see the white one. Um, you can then view out to uh, 
the rest of your pod, like you know, what I talked about, you have that courtyard. You you look at the rest of the of the habitat. It's a, it's about a ten minute video. It goes over day and night even, so you can sit there and see the the, uh, the sky changing as well. You see the furniture was all 3D printed um, with Nagami as well, um, with recycled plastics. And we have our um, racking system also working, so you can go in there, you can move stuff around. Uh, of course, we didn't put a real lab, it's kind of um, just MDF and all that we did. But we just want to kind of make sure that people go there, they kind of have at least that kind of physical physical experience of what it might um, look like. And you can see that is the kind of the big, this was before we had the big uh, inflatable going over, that big screen that gives you that, that, that view, it's kind of a 10 minute video, that gives you the view out to the rest of the habitat. But we had to build this inflatable, which was kind of a, a tricky one. Because on Mars, of course, there will be an airlock, Right? And you have an internal pressure, which is 100 times bigger than the external pressure, so you kind of just have a balloon inflated, which is fine. Um, we're on Earth, and we want to create something uh, that the, the visitors could, could walk through. There, there wasn't actually a pressure difference possible. Uh, so we looked at a different type of system to, to uh, design this, and um, we want to have an inflatable, but we didn't want it to look very fat, and we want to have it quite... Slim, so we start to look at these things. Uh, kite surfing kites. Um, I've got a slight obsession with it because uh, I think it's like a really interesting way of making a structure. Because a kite surfing kite has again this dual system where it has on the outside um, a sleeve, like the green one is like a sleeve, which has a certain shape. Oops. Still working? No? No? Yeah? Yeah. Um, and that gives you geometry. On the inside, down the bottom right, you have this kind of um, rubber or, or, or latex inflatable that just inflates as a big sausage, right? It doesn't really kind of keep a particular shape. But once you kind of combine these two, the outside is shear and stretch resistant, the inside isn't, you can actually start creating certain geometries. And that is with a company in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, a um, company called Dual, and there they are making these kind of inflatables. And the outside sleeves, they're made out of um, individual pieces of, of material that are all then stitched together. Um, took them quite a long time to do. Um, they were a little bit late with it, but in the end, they were able to do it. So this was one of their first prototypes um, of these structures. They're very kind of like, there's a lot of high pressure in there, and they're actually really stiff. That was the first um, prototype in the end. And, uh, and you see, you kind of have all the kind of the, the inflatable, the, the, the tabs there where you inflate the structure on. And our astronaut relaxing on our Mars habitat. Um, I think I'm going to finish with um, just a little video that we made. And that was actually our entry to, uh, to the competition. So let me finish with that. Half a century ago, we took our first step on the surface of the moon. Today, there is renewed passion to explore for our next human endeavor. Mars, the red planet, further than any human has ever been. We face many challenges, remoteness, no livable atmosphere, high radiation, dust storms, and extremely low temperatures. Before any human set foot on Mars, we must first design a protective shelter. We will protect our astronauts from radiation with a thick 3D printed shell structure using Martian regolith, which works great in compression, but does not perform well under tension. To overcome this shortfall, we have chosen to construct the pressure retaining parts of the habitat from lightweight inflatable pods. They will be made out of high precision engineered composites that are prefabricated on Earth. Their elliptoid geometry will be able to mitigate the pressure differences whilst optimizing spatial planning. To create the base on Mars, we will use a two-phase approach. In phase one, an ecosystem of 3D printing robots will arrive months in advance of any human explorer. They will construct the protective shield for the base by adopting a modular robotic swarm strategy, a plan that allows for redundancies and enhances the odds for success. 
Intelligent autonomous robots will have interchangeable roles, from battery storage to scout rovers, logistics to excavational, and even 3D printing units, all integrated with multiple cameras and sensors for navigation. They can reconfigure themselves for a multitude of purposes, ensuring prolonged usage beyond the initial build phases. The smallest configuration is the one-wheeled scout rover that uses ultrasonic scanning to analyze the Martian surface to determine the best regions for obtaining optimum regolith. The digger receives the location coordinates and then excavates the Martian soil. It then delivers the payload to the refining assemblies. Here, large chunks of Martian regolith can be processed down to a finer grain and then delivered to the melter robots in situ. They then use concentrated microwaves to melt the regolith and extrude through the 3D printing nozzle. The shell is autonomously 3D printed, layer by layer, over several months by the robotic system. In the next phase, the first astronauts arrive with the habitation units, equipment, and supplies. The robots now take on their second life roles to aid the next phase. They come together to make flexible mobile platforms that can carry the payload from the loading zone to the base. The convoy begins its journey across the Martian surface to the habitat site. The build commences with a connector module placed underneath the protective shield and ready for inflation. The module then unfolds and self-inflates into its final form. The habitation units are then placed into position and sequentially inflated to form the completed pressurized environments. The circular layout of the habitat ensures continuous accessibility of the habitat in the event of a catastrophic failure. Each connector module houses three integrated environmental control life support systems, delivering essential services like power, water, data, and oxygen to all the habitation units. A circular conduit delivers these services to multiple endpoints in each pod. The base will be remotely powered by two nuclear kilo power reactors and a solar farm, located a safe distance away from the base. In the next stage, the astronauts will construct and install a flat pack, rail-based racking system capable of connecting to the distribution system, enabling spaces to reconfigure according to their spatial needs. This modular and radical design principle has been adopted for all the habitat pods, ensuring multi-use, reconfigurable environments. A Martian base should not just be a habitat. It is home for the astronauts. Each pod expresses its own identity, quality, and character. A highly functional design which places the human experience at the core. Spaces include a state-of-the-art research laboratory, a hydroponic greenhouse, a fully equipped workshop with digital fabrication facilities, the sleeping quarters with gym facilities, and immersive virtual reality platform. We believe that the key to success of human habitation on Mars is the health and well-being of its residents, creating a place where work life and living combine holistically to ensure they feel connected to each other, to themselves, and somehow to their distant home.
like it's my uh, like building on Mars is my my pa also passion is like really like to do that. However, it's like like a telemarketing like I, I want to buy it. It's like so good, but is it really? Um, well, I don't know. Of course, because yeah, but but, I'm just, but, then, I'm just, but you build you have the machine, well, right? Yeah, but you kind of as an architect, I haven't built the robot yet, right? It's a visualization, it's a concept, and I think that's what we're good at, right? Architects, architects are good at somehow bringing lots of bits of knowledge and trying to understand most of it, or a little bit of it, or enough of it, and then bringing it together and coming up with the with the concept and the idea of it, and that has to be super powerful, right? And that's really important. Um, so, as as not that, like in this field, we, you have to kind of sit in this kind of bizarre zone where you, um, which doesn't really happen a lot in, in, in space development. So. Before I start this project, before I start the other projects I did, I looked at what is out there, right? And there were like two extremes. On the one hand side, there was people who do really detailed studies, right? Maybe about an airlock. You know, all about the airlock, right? 50 white papers about this airlock. And on the other hand, what you also have in space is people to come up with artist impressions. It's hilarious. Is this kind of like, you know, some person spends about half a day in making a drawing, but it's science fiction because a lot of it isn't actually true. Isn't it's just and there's loads of these imagery that you see done by ESA, done by NASA, and all that. And you look at them and you're like, this is a bit ridiculous, right? Um, so as an architect, I want to make sure that we kind of stay in that middle road where I are able to kind of give an overall view that is hopefully quite believable and that use technology that is kind of there or almost there um, and um, be realistic and be grounded in science and, and engineering as much as I can. But I don't know if it's all yet possible. You know, yeah. most of it is. All the bits are kind of possible, but you know, of course, we haven't done it yet. You know, but that's well, every architect is, right? We don't build the buildings. We just come up with the concepts and the drawings and the ideas and kind of putting it together. Um, so I, I do believe, as an architect, there is a, there's a very particular role to play in this field, but um, it's after all these years not really recognized yet. It's getting there, little bit by little bit. I think. But I, I just, I, as I said, I hope it's, it is and it's very, very good good work. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. More questions? Thanks. Sorry. Hi, I would, I, would, I would like to ask you about the, the living quarters because you mentioned that um, the space station, everything, that's not, you wanted more private space, but mm. I felt that in the design, I, I saw the living area. Mm but not necessarily the parts. I'm wondering how how do they... Oh yeah, we didn't, I think it's somewhere, I don't think that rendering I have there, um, but they, they, they're still quite small. Mm. They're kind of part of the racking system as well, so you kind of got like a wide rack. Okay. Um, and we kind of looked at it from, um, we kind of modeled it by looking at again at Halley 6, because at Halley 6, we asked the people that, 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 that live there, so mm. how much time do you spend in your own room? Right? Mm -hmm. Simple question. <laughs> like, well, actually, not that much. We just, we like to be, even if we read a book or something, they like to be with other people. So people love to be alone with other people, <laughs> right? Um, but they do want to have, psychologically, have their own space. That was actually quite important. But the, <laughs> the size of it wasn't actually that a major issue. Uh, so we do have these kind of small pods, almost these racks, so they kind of wide racks that everybody has their own private space, a bed, a table, uh, um, your, your storage, and that's it. And do you think there is a need for an architect to be in that building, or is everything designed on Earth? And oh, to go there? No, I'm not there. going, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like way too dangerous, I'll never go. Uh, you're crazy. <laughs> it's like super dangerous. <laughs> um, I'll go at like flight 50 or something, I'll do that. Uh, well, 
No, I don't think you need you need you don't need an architect there. Oh. You know, I think. Do you want to go? I would like to um, go. I think what you do. But this, this is an interesting, again an interesting mm. question that we asked the people from Halley Six. They said like, and also the people astronauts, right? Mm. So the astronauts. What is an astronaut? An astronaut is a very good operator. They're not the top scientists. Right, mm. but there are people who can follow instructions really clearly, really, and who are really kind of can concentrate really well, can operate under immense stress. Mm. So they're kind of perfect robots, <laughs> astronauts. Really, they are perfect robots. They, they, and if you look at it, if you go to the the European uh, Astronaut Center in, in Germany, there's a massive screen that shows what each astronaut is going to do for the next six months by, I think it's five minutes or 10 minutes slots. Yeah. So it's completely regulated what they do. There's a control room that knows what everybody is doing all the time. <coughs> so um, so again, on, on Halley 6, on the, on the Arctic base, the people that go are really practical engineers that can fix stuff. People that can operate in, and do instructions and that can fix stuff. That's the people you want. So, unfortunately, no architects, I think. I don't know. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. Thank you. Um, curious about uh, your approach here, as opposed to um, some of the speculations around either feasible bases, looking to um, uh, uh, geological features like, you know, Placing a base on Shack near Shackleton Crater because you know it's got or, or places that have been surveyed mm -hmm. to give you an advantage. In a way, your scheme almost relies on there being no site specificity mm. in some ways. Is that, could you could, could you expand a little bit on 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 how you would cite yeah. your, your scheme? Um, I didn't talk about that, like, but we we looked at a location or potential, not one specific location, but we did think about actually placing it in a valley, right? The reason for that is that you've got the mountains that protect you already from radiation. Mm -hmm. So we were that was one of the reasons that we looked at. You know, should it that should be that kind of location? Um, it's different. Like Shackleton Crater is, is, is on is on the moon, and that's that's a very good location um, because there's an issue with the moon. Is if you're on the equator, you what you get is you get 14 days of on the moon. You have 14 days of of day and 14 days of night. So you have the lunar night, which everything plummets, temperature plummets, is unlivable. So on the moon, of course, you want to go on Shackleton Crater. This is the South Pole, which means you always have the sun. The sun will be on the horizon and turns around you over 28 days, 360 degrees. So um, from env environmental reasons, we didn't really have that uh, constraint. Um, but you're right, you could, for example, start to look at uh, lava tubes, particularly on the moon, uh, as a protection, right? But then it's also how do you get into them, what is the risk? Uh, but you could potentially do that as well, yeah. That's, that's another way of looking at it. But that NASA competition was particularly about 3D printing. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but you could, in a way. It, it is another way, if, if you would have good data, mm. and uh, which we don't, of uh, 3D data of the environments, then you could start thinking that, yeah. questions. So the first one, I thought it was really smart how you uh, reuse materials for furniture and clothing, but I was wondering if, because most of the furniture is actually the racks, and if those are printed as well or brought there. And also the sec second question is, you mentioned um, it gets down to minus 150 degrees, and how do, how do the inflatable structures resist the cold weather? Good questions. Uh, well, yes, at the moment, it's as you saw in the video, they're kind of flat packed, uh, probably aluminium or something like that, uh, racks. But one of the things that I, I did start thinking about, which I'd, I'd love to start kind of developing more, is um, yeah, could we grow our racks? Could we grow bamboo and could we make our racks out of bamboo? Right? And this is kind of this weird thing because people always think about space, it's all clean, it's white, it's brushed aluminium. Um, but maybe it's a little bit closer to these um, 
people, these pioneers in America that had to, you know, maybe grow our own stuff and start making stuff. So I think that it'd be interesting to kind of see what a base looks like after 10 years. So there might be some aluminium racks, some bamboo racks. I think, I think, it, I think the aesthetics will be very different than what we think they're going to be, right? Um, hang on, what's the second question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, temperature, yeah. So, um, yeah, good question. Um, not 100% sure. We think maybe it's, it's to do with aerogels that we use something. Um, so that, that might be inflatable. Um, you know, the, the environment that you have, the, the, the inflatable on the ISS is insulating. It's also kind of protecting against micrometeorites and all that. So we feel it's possible, uh, but we haven't 100% figured it out yet. Other questions? Um, yes. Um, yeah. Oh, over there. Yeah. Um, People miss me. We, we'll get to you. <laughs> uh, so I've seen this idea grow from a sandpit with some small robots to the concept you have now. How do you think this will evolve in the next years? Uh, where's going to go next? Yes. Oh, gosh. Um, so, um, well, for me, the next step, what I would love to do is really uh, build a proper analog. Right, build a proper test base. Most of the analogs that have been developed by NASA, by ESA, and all that, uh, there was no designer involved. Right, uh, they're terribly built. Uh, it's all about the psychology of these astronauts. They kind of put them in these analogs and, and do tests in the Atacama Desert or on the Antarctic. Um, but I think the environment where you live in is has a mass, massive influence on your psychological and your, and your well-being. So I'm really that's. For me, the next step is actually building one um, and as, as a proper Mars analog uh, somewhere on Earth. So, step by step. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> Waiting for a long time. I, I have two questions related to the fabrication. Say again? To the uh, I have two questions related to fabrication. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, the first one is um, last year, Relativity's target, they, they made this 3D print, uh, uh, like a 3D print, metal 3D printer. Mm -hmm. So um, has NASA looked into that to use the cargo shells to recycle the metal parts to build parts for the, mm -hmm. for the, like, yeah. for the space? Um, yeah, I think uh, well, you saw our workshop um, that we have a bunch of 3D printers in there to kind of, and maybe it has a metal printer in, who knows. Um, will we actually bring, I think the way where metal printing is, is still a quite a complicated uh, process that needs a very much a control environment. So, um, you know, it won't be in the first generation. I think, you know, um, there is a, an, an FDM printer on the International Space Station. I think they're going to bring the second one in now. There was one by NASA. ESA did one now as well. Um, but it's so much, if you kind of, if you f follow it a little bit, if you kind of see how much involvement is in there in actually developing something that is actually works in space, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, and, you know, development for just a simple FDM printer to get it to work in the ISS, um, yeah. Metal printers, I think we're still a bit, yeah. it's not gonna happen yeah. that, that quickly, I, I believe. But maybe I'm wrong. The second question is uh, related to the fabrication of the shell itself. Usually extrusions don't exactly happen perfectly. They under-extrude or over-extrude. So the depositor, the one, the mm. microwave depositor, does it have a sensor as well to calibrate? It has now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, you know, of course we haven't figured everything out yet, you know. And yeah, these are all the things that will need to be, uh, be looked at. You know, how level is it? How how you, you know, yeah, of course. But, you know, in a, in a three months project, you can't really do everything. But yeah, thank you. Now you kind of maybe remind me we probably need to do that. <laughs> okay. And the, one more question in the back. Another question? Um, two, last question. Two, two. Okay, last Your last two then. So you, you get all the questions. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> We're just two engineers sitting at the back here. We really enjoyed this, this <laughs> talk. Um, we have an engineer's question. <laughs> um, between the, the 
between the brief from NASA and the delivery of your proposal? How yeah. long? How long did it take? What? How much time was there? Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, to bring it all together, because it felt like you brought a lot of you know, uh, expertise, quite, disciplines. Quite, it's quite intense. Um, uh, process. It was over a year, but we didn't work on it for the full year. So um, what we did do at, at one point was um, we were kind of halfway through the project and I really felt, um, damn, I need, I need some consultants here. I need some people to come and give me some input. So uh, what we did, we organized this um, uh, little symposium um, and um, I invited people that I thought would kind of bring us interesting knowledge for this project. And so we invited a uh, professor of mining, um, we invited people with robotics background, um, people with, uh, and um, what was it, um, space anthropologists we brought in, people with radiation, radiation experts. Um, and we brought them all in to a room. We had like quick presentations. And then most of the afternoon, what we did, we did an architectural crit with all of them. So we put all our work up on a massive wall. And we said to all the scientists, please tell us everything that's wrong with this, right? And we talked through it. It's like we did an architecture crit. And it took us about four hours. And it was the most interesting afternoon we had. We taped the whole thing. And uh, that was for us really interesting because it just kind of shifted things and we were able to kind of change things uh, very quickly. And, and the funny thing was is that some of the scientists thought this kind of review process was quite interesting because they never do that. They never stand in a room with 10 other people and just really hack into it, right? They'll write a paper and they go to, to a conference and, you know, that process of design, they didn't know. And it was for them, it was like kind of, wow, maybe we should try to do that as well sometimes. Um, was there another question or? It's answered? All right, cool. Is that it? Cool. Thank you very much.